Chapter Five of Stories from Patamarone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. Stories from Patamarone by Giambattista Passire. Chapter Five: The Flea. Resolutions taken without thought bring disasters without remedy. He who behaves like a fool repents like a wise man, as happened to the king of High Hill, who through unexampled folly committed an act of madness, putting in jeopardy both his daughter and his honour. Once upon a time the king of High Hill, being bitten by a flea, caught him by a wonderful feat of dexterity, and seeing how handsome and stately he was, he had not the conscience to sentence him to death. So he put him into a bottle, and feeding him every day himself, the little animal grew at such a rate that at the end of seven months it was necessary to shift his quarters, for he was grown bigger than a sheep. The king then had him flayed and his skin dressed. Then he issued a proclamation that whoever could tell what this skin was should marry the princess. As soon as this decree was made known, the people flocked in crowds from all the ends of the world to try their luck. One said that it belonged to an ape, another to a lynx, a third to a crocodile, and in short some gave it to one animal and some to another. But they were all a hundred miles from the truth, and not one hit the nail on the head. At last there came to this trial an ogre who was the most ugly being in the world, the very sight of whom would make the boldest man tremble and quake with fear. But no sooner had he come and turned the skin round and smelt it, than he instantly guessed the truth, saying, This skin belongs to the king of fleas. Now the king saw that the ogre had hit the mark, and not to break his word he ordered his daughter Porziella to be called. Porziella had a face like milk and roses, and was such a miracle of beauty that you would never be tired of looking at her. And the king said to her, My daughter, you know who I am. I cannot go back from my promise, whether a king or a beggar. My word is given, and I must keep it though my heart should break. Who would ever have imagined that this prize would have fallen to an ogre? But it never does to judge hastily. Have patience, then, and do not oppose your father, for my heart tells me that you will be happy, for rich treasures are often found inside a rough earthen jar. When Porziella heard this sad saying, her eyes grew dim, her face turned pale, her lips fell, her knees shook, and at last, bursting into tears, she said to her father, what crime have I committed that I should be punished thus? How have I ever behaved badly toward you that I should be given up to this monster? Is this, O oh father, the affection you bear to your own child? Is this the love you show to her whom you used to call the joy of your soul? Do you drive from your sight her who is the apple of your eye? O oh father, O oh cruel father, better had it been if my cradle had been my deathbed since I have lived to see this evil day. Porziella was going on to say more when the king, in a furious rage, exclaimed, "'Stay your anger, fair and softly, for appearances deceive. Is it for a girl to teach her father, forsooth? Have done, I say, for if I lay these hands upon you, I'll not leave a whole bone in your skin. Prithee, how long has a child, hardly out of the nursery, dared to oppose my will? Quick, then, I say, take his hand and set off with him home this very instant, for I will not have that saucy face a minute longer in my sight.' Poor Porziella, seeing herself thus caught in the net, with the face of a person condemned to death, with the heart of one whose head is lying between the axe and the block, took the hand of the ogre, who dragged her off without any attendance to the wood where the trees made a palace for the meadow, to prevent its being discovered by the sun, and the brooks murmured, having knocked against the stones in the dark, while the wild beasts wandered where they liked without paying toll, and went safely through the thicket whither no man ever came, unless he had lost his way. Upon this spot, which was as black as an unswept chimney, stood the ogre's house ornamented all round with the bones of the men whom he had devoured. Think but a moment of the horror of it to the poor girl. But this was nothing at all in comparison with what was to come. Before dinner she had peas, and after dinner parched beans. Then the ogre went out to hunt, and returned home laden with the quarters of the men whom he had killed, saying, 
"'Now, wife, you cannot complain that I don't take good care of you. "'Here is a fine store of eatables. "'Take and make merry and love me well, "'for the sky will fall before I will let you want for food.' "'Poor Porziella could not endure this horrible sight "'and turned her face away. "'But when the ogre saw this, he cried, "'Ha! This is throwing sweetmeats before swine. "'Never mind, however. "'Only have patience till tomorrow morning, "'for I have been invited to a wild boar hunt "'and will bring you home a couple of boars, "'and will make a grand feast with our kinsfolk "'and celebrate the wedding.' "'So saying, he went into the forest. "'Now as Porziella stood weeping at the window, "'it chanced that an old woman passed by "'who, being famished with hunger, begged some food. "'Ah, my good woman,' said Porziella, "'heaven knows I am in the power of the ogre "'who brings me home nothing but pieces of the men he has killed.' I pass the most miserable life possible, and yet I am the daughter of a king, and have been brought up in luxury. And so saying, she began to cry like a little girl, who sees her bread and butter taken away from her. The old woman's heart was softened at this sight, and she said to Porziella, Be of good heart, my pretty girl. Do not spoil your beauty with crying, for you have met with luck. I can help you to both saddle and trappings. Listen now. I have seven sons who, you see, are seven giants, Marse, Nardo, Cola, Miko, Petrullo, Ascadeo, and Ciccone, who have more virtues than Rosemary, especially Marse, for every time he lays his ear to the ground, he hears all that is passing within thirty miles round. Nardo, every time he washes his hands, makes a great sea of soap suds. Every time that Cola throws a bit of iron on the ground, he makes a field of sharp razors. "'whenever Mikko flings down a little stick of tangled wood springs up. "'If Petrula lets fall a drop of water, it makes a terrible river. "'When Ascadeo wishes a strong tower to spring up, he has only to throw a stone. "'And Ciccone shoots so straight with the crossbow that he can hit a hen's eye a mile off. "'Now with the help of my sons, who are all courteous and friendly, "'and who will all take compassion on your condition, "'I will contrive to free you from the claws of the ogre.' "'No time better than now,' replied Porziella, "'for that evil shadow of a husband of mine "'has gone out and will not return this evening, "'and we shall have time to slip off and run away.' "'It cannot be this evening,' replied the old woman, "'for I live a long way off. "'But I promise you that tomorrow morning "'I and my sons will all come together "'and help you out of your trouble.' "'So saying, the old woman departed, "'and Porziella went to rest with a light heart "'and slept soundly all night.' But as soon as the birds began to cry, Long live the sun! Lo and behold, there was the old woman with her seven children, and placing Porziella in the midst of them, they proceeded towards the city. But they had not gone above half a mile when Marse put his ear to the ground and cried, Hallo, have a care! Here's the fox! The ogre's come home! He has missed his wife, and he is hastening after us with his cap under his arm. No sooner did Nardo hear this than he washed his hands and made a sea of soap suds, and when the ogre came and saw all the suds, he ran home, and fetching a sack of bran, he strewed it about and worked away treading it down with his feet, until at last he got over this obstacle, though with great difficulty. But Masse put his ear once more to the ground and exclaimed, "'Look sharp, Conrad! Here he comes!' Thereupon Kola flung a piece of iron on the ground, and instantly a field of razors sprang up. When the ogre saw the path stopped, he ran home again and clad himself in iron from head to foot, and then returned and got over this peril. Then Marseille again, putting his ear to the ground, cried, Up, up, to arms, to arms, for see, here is the ogre coming at such a rate that he is actually flying. But Mikko was ready with his little stick, and in an instant he caused a terrible wood to rise up, so thick that it was quite impenetrable. When the ogre came to this difficult pass, he laid hold of a carara knife which he wore at his side, and began to cut down the poplars and oaks and pine trees and chestnut trees, right and left, so that with four or five strokes he had the whole forest on the ground and got clear of it. Presently, Masa, who kept his ears on the alert like a hare, again raised his voice and cried, now we must be off, for the ogre is coming like the wind, and here he is at our heels. 
As soon as Petrullo heard this, he took water from a little fountain, sprinkled it on the ground, and in a twinkling of an eye, a large river rose up on the spot. When the ogre saw this new obstacle, and that he could not make holes so fast as they found bungs to stop him, he stripped himself stark naked, and swam across to the other side of the river with his clothes upon his head. Marseille, who put his ear to every chink, heard the ogre coming and exclaimed, "'Alas, matters go ill with us now. I already hear the clatter of the ogre's heels. We must be on our guard and ready to meet the storm, or else we are done for.' "'Never fear,' said Escadeo. "'I will soon settle this ugly ragamuffin.' So saying, he flung a pebble on the ground, and instantly up rose a tower in which they all took refuge without delay, and barred the door. But when the ogre came up, and saw that they had got into so safe a place, he ran home, got a vine-dresser's ladder, and carried it back on his shoulder to the tower. Now Marseille, who kept his ears hanging down, heard at a distance the approach of the ogre, and cried, "'We are now at the butt-end of the candle of hope. Chacone is our last resource, for the ogre is coming back in a terrible fury. Alas, how my heart beats, for I foresee an evil day!' "'You coward,' answered Ciccone. "'Trust to me, and I will hit him with a ball.' As Ciccone was speaking, the ogre came, planted his ladder, and began to climb up. But Ciccone, taking aim at him, shot out one of his eyes and laid him at full length on the ground, like a pear dropped from a tree. Then he went out of the tower and cut off the ogre's head with a big knife he carried about with him, just as if it had been new-made cheese.' Thereupon they took the head with great joy to the king, who rejoiced at the recovery of his daughter, for he had repented a hundred times at having given her to an ogre. And not many days after, Porziella was married to a handsome prince, and the seven sons and their mother who had delivered her from such a wretched life were rewarded with great riches. End of chapter 5